Welcome to the Wyoming Women's Hi, Business everyone. Center's 2019 webinar series. Today's presentation is Understanding General Sales and Use Tax in Wyoming. I'm Christine Langley with the Wyoming Women's Business Center, and I'll be your moderator today. You'll notice the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen. And I want to call attention to both the questions panel and the chat box. If you have any comments or questions during the webinar today, I'd like you to use those to communicate with us. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So you can just go to youtube.com and type in Wyoming Women's Business Center. Make sure you subscribe and check out all of our other webinars. You can also visit our website at wyomingwomen.org or look for us on Facebook and Instagram to know about upcoming webinars and trainings. Immediately following this presentation, we're gonna launch a survey. We ask you to complete this survey because it provides us and our funding partners with valuable information. Again, all participants are muted to minimize background noise. So if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, go ahead and type them in that chat box or the questions panel. So we're gonna get started just with some quick information about the Wyoming Women's Business Center, and then we'll dive into our topic today and finish up with a Q&A at the end. Now, the Wyoming Women's Business Center is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to enable and empower Wyoming entrepreneurs with a special emphasis on women who are economically or socially disadvantaged. And so we do that through four distinct programs. The first is our business counseling and training program, which is always free. The second is our microfinance programs, where we offer microloans as well as individual development accounts. The third is an artist development center that we run in conjunction with our Works of Wyoming store and Art Connect Gallery in downtown Laramie. And lastly, we recently launched our COVID-19 support program that has a robust number of projects to help not only existing businesses, but also startups um, with marketing support. So this particular webinar series is brought to you by our microfinance program. And I wanna call special attention to our microloan program. We can provide loans for those unable to get loans through traditional means for up to $50,000. And so if you'd like more information on that, you can contact our microlending director, Waldo Smith. All right, so I'm excited to introduce Lynn Frank today from the Wyoming Department of Revenue. Um, Lynn has had a successful career since she joined the department in February of 2015 as a tax examiner, and she was promoted to senior tax examiner in August 2016, and then she was promoted again in March of 2019 to her current position as principal tax examiner. So right now, I'm just going to switch over presenters so that Lynn is the one that has her screen showing. So Lynn, you should have a little pop-up where you can accept, and then we'll see Lynn's screen. Uh, do you see my screen? Because we do, we can, we can kind of see a dual screen, and I've got topics for discussion, and then you also have your go-to webinar um, okay. screen up. So it kind of looks like a dual screen. So I'll give you a few minutes to kind of figure that out. Um, Lynn tells me that sales tax is not a black and white issue. It's certainly an ever-changing and challenging environment. And the education and taxability section of the excise tax division is actually charged with providing written determinations to taxpayers, as well as providing education in regards to sales and use tax in the state. And so that education piece of Lynn's position is the reason that she accepted our invitation to be our expert speaker today. All right, Lynn, it looks like we're in your Gmail inbox now. There we go, there's your PowerPoint, excellent. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right, we knew we would get to it. So just on a- Yeah, I've had technical difficulties all day today, so here we go. Well, well good afternoon, everybody. Go right ahead, Lynn. I was just going to tell everybody that you've been living in Wyoming since uh, 2001, and you've got a background in elementary education as well, working with uh, Laramie County School District 1 for about five years. So welcome, Lynn, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, and like I said, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am relatively new to the Department of Revenue, 
and um, it is an exciting position. It is very challenging, I will say that. And with that, we're going to get started on what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to touch on um, sales tax. We'll talk about property types. We have both tangible and real property. We're going to talk about three different types of taxpayers in Wyoming. We're also going to talk about what's taxable, the invoices. We'll talk about freight, sales tax rate. Um, we're talking about use tax. Um, we'll touch on some exemptions, reporting requirements, and then taxpayer rights. So, in Wyoming, sales tax is an excise tax that's imposed on sales and leases of tangible personal property, admissions, and some services. So, when we talk about tangible personal property, this is the definition of tangible personal property in statute. Basically, it means it's anything that's perceptible to the senses. So some examples of tangible personal property are vehicles, clothing, furniture, televisions, computers, um, flowers, paper, office supplies. So as you can see, it's a pretty broad definition. Now Wyoming also has three different types of taxpayers. We have vendors, consumers, and contractors. So the first taxpayer we're going to talk about are vendors. So if you're located in Wyoming and you sell tangible personal property at retail or wholesale, if you sell admissions, if you rent or lease tangible personal property, if you repair, alter, or improve tangible personal property, or if you provide oil and gas field services within an oil or gas well site, you are a vendor. Now, if you're located outside the state of Wyoming and you meet our thresholds for our remote sellers, or if you're a marketplace facilitator who meets those thresholds, you are also considered a vendor. Now, I bring this up because even though this is our statute or our uh, thresholds for people selling into our state, Every state in the United States at this point in time, if they are collecting sales tax, probably has a remote seller bill similar to this. Their thresholds may be different, but you would also, if you are selling, especially on the internet, which is a hot topic these days for people that sell on the internet, either for through their own website or through Amazon, um, eBay, other marketplace facilitators, you will want to check with those states with whom you will be doing business because they're going to have their own licensing and reporting requirements. Now, if you are a vendor, you are required to be licensed to collect um, sales tax with the department. So, as a licensed vendor, you should notify the department if you have a change or if you add a location or if maybe you um, close a location. If you have a change of address, and this could be your physical address or it could be a mailing address. If there's a change of ownership, or if you acquire a liquor license, and that liquor license and the sales tax license must be in the same name. If you need to cancel your license, or if you have a change in the type of sales you make. Maybe you were selling books and now you decide you're going to sell shoes. Um, the reason we need to know this is because it affects our distribution report. The other time you would want to contact the department is if you want someone else to have access to your account. Maybe you have your accountant or a bookkeeper or your attorney. We would need to have a completed um, power of attorney in order to be able to do that. So now we've defined a vendor, and we were going to go on and talk about what is taxable in the state. So sales tax is imposed on all retail sales of tangible personal property. 
It's also imposed on leases or contracts where there is a transfer of possession of the tangible personal property. It's also imposed on intrastate communications, so your in-state long distance. Sales tax is imposed on intrastate transportation of passengers. So we're talking your taxis, your Ubers, shuttles. Sales tax is also imposed on your gas, electricity, or heat. So basically our utilities. Sales tax is imposed on meals and covered charges where meals are sold to the public. So we're talking about your restaurants or even these food trucks that you see every now and then. Sales tax is imposed on lodging services for transient guests. And transient guests are those who stay for less than 30 continuous days. Sales tax is also imposed on admissions to places of amusement, uh, recreation, games or athletic events. So we're talking about rodeos, football games, baseball games, concerts and movie tickets. And generally the sales tax is added into the price of the ticket. Wyoming also imposes sales tax on services that repair, alter, or improve tangible personal property. So vehicle repairs or computer repairs. Sales tax is imposed on those who perform within an oil or gas well site. It's also imposed on the sales of motor vehicles, house trailers, um, trailers, and semi-trailers. Sales tax is imposed on computer hardware, so your keyboards, modems, or um, those sorts of things, or pre-written software like your QuickBooks. And lastly, it's also imposed on specified digital products. These are things that are down, like downloaded games or ringtones um, or digital books when the purchaser receives permanent use of those products. Now, there are also some services in Wyoming that are not subject to sales tax. You can see the list here. This is not, in, this is not the only ones that are not taxable services, but just some of them to mention a few. Your accountants, your attorneys, doctors, dentists. Um, you do see on there consultants. And what we like to say about a consultant is if they can do their job with their hand tied behind their back, their service is not taxable. So some other charges that um, I like to mention, um, specifically freight, because whenever you have products, there's always freight involved, and sometimes it can get confusing. So in Wyoming, we have two different types of freight. We have inbound freight and outbound freight. And inbound freight represents the cost incurred by a vendor to get the product to his shelf. Inbound freight becomes a part of the sales price of the product. And it doesn't matter if the freight is separately stated on an invoice or not, it's still taxable. So for example, if you were to purchase a vehicle, there's a sticker on the car that shows a delivery charge. That delivery charge is what the dealer pays to have the car delivered to his lot. That delivery charge is considered inbound freight, and even though it's separately stated on the invoice, it's still taxable to the customer. The other type of freight is outbound freight. An outbound freight is not taxable and it's associated with a retail sale. Outbound freight is the cost the customer incurs to get the product to his location. So outbound freight must be separately stated on the customer's invoice that includes other taxable items or the entire invoice is subject to tax. So for example, if I were to purchase some furniture and I want it delivered to my home, my invoice would show a delivery fee separately stated from the cost of the furniture and that delivery charge would not be subject to tax. So when I talk about a separately stated invoice, you can see two invoices on the screen. The invoice on the left, I buy a computer package. You can see that on there for $1,599.99. In that computer package, I'm going to get the computer. I'm going to purchase some software. I'm going to get tech support for a year, and that, that computer package will be sent to my home. 
So when you look at the lump sum invoice, you can see that there's nothing separately stated on there. So therefore, the entire computer package would be subject to sales tax. Now, when you look at the invoice on the right, you can clearly see that the computer and the software are taxable, and you can see that the tech support and the uh, shipping and handling is not taxable. So you can see that by separately stating an invoice, the customer can see what charges are taxable and what are not. And you can also see that the amount of sales tax that will be collected saves the customer a little bit of money. So now that we've talked about what is taxable, we're going to talk about how to determine the sales tax rate to apply to that. And in Wyoming, we base the point of taxability on the point of possession, or what we call receive and receipt. And this does not include possession of a shipping company on behalf of the purchaser. So for retail sales, our uh, sourcing rules are progressive. We start with the first rule, which says that sales tax is sourced to a business location when the, biz when the customer takes possession of the product. In other words, I'm in a store in Casper where I make maybe a purchase a pair of shoes. The sales tax on that purchase is based on Natrone County rates since that's where I'm taking possession of those shoes. If that rule doesn't apply, we move on to the second one, which is that the sales tax is sourced to where the customer takes possession of the product. So if I order dishes from a store in Sundance and I have them shipped to my home here in Laramie County, the sales tax will be charged based on Laramie County rates because that's where I'm going to receive the dishes. If that rule doesn't apply, we move on to the third one, which is that sales tax is sourced to a location loca um, indicated by an address for the purchaser that might be available in your business records. Maybe you have a customer that has regular delivery of products you would have his address on file and you can apply sales tax based on the address that you have on file. The next rule is that sales tax is based on an address obtained at the conclusion of a sale, so a payment advice. And the last rule, if none of those apply, is the, that sales tax is applied based on where the, sh the product was shipped from or delivered electronically. This may apply to the purchase of a digital product that gets downloaded, and maybe it's purchased with a gift card. When we talk about the tax on services, that is based on where the service is received or where the customer makes first use of the service, whichever comes first. So if I were to take my laptop to a store in Laramie County for repair, when the repairs are completed, I pick up that laptop, I'm going to pay sales tax on both the labor and materials for that repair based on Laramie County rates. If that laptop were shipped to a repair shop in Sheridan and the repairs are made and shipped back to me in Laramie County, the tax on that repair would be based on Laramie County rates because again, that's where I will be able to make first use of that service. Now, if a customer from Nebraska were to ship his laptop to that repair shop in Sheridan, when that laptop is repaired and shipped back to the customer in Nebraska, no Wyoming sales tax would be collected since the customer is making first use of that repair outside of the state of Wyoming. Now, if a customer ships his laptop to a repair shop in South Dakota, where the repairs are made, if that South Dakota vendor is licensed to collect Wyoming sales tax, they would do that based on where that laptop is going to be received in Wyoming. If they're not uh, licensed to collect Wyoming sales tax, then the customer is responsible to accrue the use tax on the repairs of that laptop. Our second type of Wyoming taxpayer is a consumer. And a consumer is defined as someone who exercises the right of ownership over tangible personal property, taxable services, or admissions. 
consumers pay sales tax to the vendors at the time of purchase, or they're going to pay use tax to the department on any untaxed or undertaxed purchases. And basically, we're all consumers. We all make purchases every day. Businesses are also consumers because they make purchases of products that they need to run their businesses. Purchases like maybe office furniture, or computers, um, office supplies, signage, electricity. And some of these purchases are made online. So if the vendor is licensed to collect sales tax, the vendor would collect the sales tax based on the county where the products are received. If the vendor is not licensed to collect Wyoming sales tax, like I previously stated, the Wyoming customer would pay the use tax, or the Wyoming consumer, I'm sorry, would pay the use tax to the department on that purchase. So use tax is complementary to sales tax. And it involves an out-of-state vendor not licensed to collect Wyoming sales tax and a Wyoming customer when that purchase is brought into Wyoming for storage, use, or consumption. And use tax helps put Wyoming vendors on equal footing with vendors that are not required to collect sales tax. So most people aren't even aware of use tax, and as a result, the state loses a lot of tax dollars on purchases that are made outside of Wyoming uh, from vendors that are not licensed to collect sales tax. However, with the implementation of the Remote Sellers Bill and the Marketplace Facilitators Bill, this has helped bridge the gap uh, in otherwise tax dollars that would not have been collected. So our second type of property, we've already talked about tangible personal property. Now we're going to talk about real property. Now, as I stated before, the definition of tangible personal property is a pretty broad definition, and it's only limited by the definition of real property. Now, the definition of real property is both a statement and a test. Real property is defined as land and appurtenances, including structures affixed thereto. Pretty simple. We're talking about parking lots, homes, undeveloped lands, and buildings. And that's the easy part of the definition, which goes on to state that an article is considered real property if it's buried or embedded. So we're talking about electrical lines, uh, gas lines, or cable lines, or telephone lines. We're also talking about fence posts or telephone poles. These items are buried or embedded, and they're also considered real property. Now, if an article is not land or not an appurtenance, and it's not buried or embedded, we have to take it through a three-part test. Is it physically or constructively annexed to the real property? Is it adapted to the use of the real property? And can one reasonably infer that the intent is to make it a permanent part of the real property? So we like to use a home furnace as an example. Obviously, a home furnace is not land, and it isn't buried or embedded. So we take it through the three-part test. Is the home furnace access or annexed to the real property? It is, because it's hardwired into our homes. Is it adapted to the use of the real property? It is, because it heats our homes. And is it intended to become a permanent part of our homes? It is intended to become a permanent part of the home for the useful life of that furnace. That doesn't mean that the furnace can't ever be replaced, but for the useful life of it, it is intended to be permanent. It isn't something you take on vacation with you when you, when you do that. When we consider a space heater, on the other hand, the space heater doesn't pass the three-part test. It isn't hardwired into your home. It's adapted to the use of the home because it heats the space that it's in, but it isn't intended to become a permanent part of the home. So since a space heater can't meet the three-part test, it is not considered real property. Which takes us to the third type of taxpayer in Wyoming, and that is a contractor. Now, in Wyoming, a contractor is defined as a person who agrees with the owner or lessee to perform services to furnish materials and services like a 
an electrician or a plumber, somebody that does snow removal or pest control. A contractor might be someone who acts on behalf of an owner or lessee to arrange for the furnishing of services or furnishes materials and services like a construction company. A contractor could be a person who owns or leases real property in order to develop that property, like commercial real estate or residential developers. Or a contractor could be someone who agrees to perform any part of the contractor's obligation, like a subcontractor. Now, contractors are the end consumers of all the materials and supplies that they use to perform their service. In Wyoming, a contractor is not licensed just for that reason. If you were to have your roof replaced, you don't buy the shingles, the nails, and the flashing. You're purchasing the service to have your roof replaced. And included in that service are the shingles, the nails, and the flashing. And labor to real property in Wyoming is not taxable, provided that it's done outside of an oil or gas well site. Now, contractors sometimes work for exempt entities. The exempt entity does have an exemption, but that exemption does not pass through to contractors. They are the persons that are responsible for their, the sales tax on those supplies that they purchase. If an exempt entity were to purchase the supplies themselves, then their exemption would remain intact. Um, and that exempt entity would have to purchase those products from a supplier that is not, or I'm, I'm sorry, the supplier and the contractor cannot be the same company. And then they would hire that contractor for a labor only contract. Now, there are times that contractors are acting as vendors and contractors by performing services to both tangible personal property and real property. A locksmith, for example, might provide a service to unlock a vehicle, but they may also rekey homes and apartments. Contractors may perform dual roles by selling and consuming tangible personal property in a service to real property. A plumber might sell faucets and other fixtures to a customer and they do not provide installation and they may also install those faucets and fixtures into a customer's home. As a result, a dual role contractor can maintain a tax-free inventory by purchasing products on a wholesale for resale basis since they're either going to charge sales tax to their customer in a retail sale or they will accrue the sales tax when they remove those products from their inventory when they provide a service to real property. So now that we've talked about what's taxable in Wyoming and we've talked about our various type of taxpayers, we're gonna move on and talk about some exemptions that are available in the state. The Wyoming legislature creates statutes imposing sales tax, and through exemptions, the legislature creates acts of grace from the normal rule of taxability. Wyoming's exemptions cover a broad range of reasoning that typically include three types of exemptions, entity-based, use-based, and product-based exemptions. I'm not going to go into them in any great detail because they are available on our website, but some entity-based exemptions are exemptions for the state of Wyoming, the federal government, political subdivisions of the state of Wyoming, religious organizations, qualifying charitable organizations, and admissions to and user fees for county or municipally owned recreational facilities. Some of the exemptions we have for various industries, there's exemptions for farmers and ranchers, for manufacturers, we have exemptions in the transportation industry. There's some medical exemptions. Um, the food for domestic home consumption is an exemption that the state currently has, and that is afforded to anybody. 
there is an exemption for wholesale sales, and this is for licensed vendors only. The uh, exemption for trade-ins, there's an exemption for gasoline and gas haul for professional engineers, uh, boiler fuel, fuel, coal, gasification, and liquefaction. And like I said, you can find a whole list of these on our website. Now, in order to take advantage of an exemption, a Wyoming uh, purchaser would need to provide their vendor with a properly completed exemption certificate. You can accept an exemption certificate from an out-of-state vendor, provided that it captures the same data elements as ours does. This exemption certificate is what relieves the vendor from collecting sales tax. And you can also accept direct pay permits in addition to or in lieu of an exemption certificate. So this is a copy of, or this is what our exemption certificate looks like. In order for this to be considered properly completed, the entire form would need to be filled out. You would need to have to explain your type of business and the exemption that you're claiming. And Wyoming is what we call a good faith state, which means that provided that you, the vendor is um, except the vendor accepts the exemption certificate, they are relieved of the collection of sales tax, provided that does not constitute fraud on the vendor's behalf. So we're going to move on and talk about some reporting requirements. Now sales tax is collected by a Wyoming vendor and it is reported on a form 411 or 421 for annual filers. Sales tax is due by the last day of the month following the month the sale was made. So a sale made in July would not be reported to the department until August 31st. Use tax is remitted by Wyoming consumers of goods and services. Use tax is also due by the last day of the month following the month the product was purchased and received in Wyoming. So if a purchase was made and received in July, the use tax would be remitted by the end of August of this year. And vendors and dual role contractors would report their sales and use tax on a Form 411 or 421. Consumers are going to report any use tax on a Form 441 and contractors would report use tax on a Form 45 one. Now, you can apply for sales tax in two different places. If you want to um, file a paper um, application, that's perfectly fine. It is available on our website. You would fill it out, send it into the department with the $60 fee, and then you would receive your, uh, your sales tax license. When you file your sales tax as a with a paper form, that paper uh, file, uh, I'm sorry, that return is generated in our office. So before you send your return in, you would want to make sure you're using the correct form. And because that form is generated in our office, if you lose it for some reason, you should probably call the department and get a, an extra one or get one sent to you. That is because we barcode these. If you use one that is not for the correct month, that creates a real problem with your account. So you want to make sure the entire form is completed, you want to check for any calculation errors, and you want to make sure that the form is signed. We also have the second way to apply for a sales tax license and also to report your sales tax would be using our YF system. WYFS is for the Wyoming Internet Filing System. And to apply for a license, this is a two-step process. You would need to create a username and password. That comes into our office. Once it's absorbed by our system, you will receive a PIN number. Once you get that PIN number, you can go back in and complete the application process. You will also use that PIN number when you file your sales tax. 
The advantage to using our online system is that payments can be uh, submitted via ACH debit or an e-check, credit card, or by traditional check. It has built-in edits to make sure that your return doesn't have any costly errors. It provides an online transaction history and it's available 24-7. Now, a real important thing is, of course, records retention. The department says, or we, have, we uh, recommend, that you preserve your invoices, purchase orders, contracts, bills of lading, or delivery slips for three years. A good rule of thumb is to save the current year's records plus the previous three years. And you would want to preserve exemption certificates and copies of direct pay permits indefinitely. Now, in the state of Wyoming, you have, as taxpayer, you have rights. You have a right to request a clear explanation of your account. You have the right to know that no employee of the state benefits from assessments or collections from taxpayers. You have the right to confidentiality. You have the right to have penalties and interest waived if you relied on written information from the department, provided that the department was was provided facts that were complete and correct. You have the right to request a payment plan on your tax assessment, and you have the right to appeal to the State Board of Equalization. Here are a couple of contact um, emails, should you need them. The first one is for our vendor operations section. They are the people that you would contact if you need help with applying for a sales tax license or if you have any questions on your account. If you ever have any questions on what's taxable in the state, um, you can contact the Education and Taxability section. I would also encourage you to visit our website because we have many bulletins and publications that provide information on various industries and also on information and topics that we've discussed today and some that we didn't. You can also get a copy of the exemption certificate. You'll find a tax rate chart on our website, as well as any webinars that you might want to attend that the department does provide to taxpayers. And with that, I want to thank you, Christine, for allowing me to present this today. Great, thanks so much, Lynn. And I'm just converting over so people can see my screen. And we're gonna now start taking some questions. And I see a lot of people type some things in as we went. So Lynn, I'm just gonna read these off to you. Um, this first one is a two-part question. And if anybody else has questions, go ahead and enter them in that question panel. And we're just gonna click through these before we finish up today. Um, so this is a two-part question. The first part is, I am a graphic designer, and as I understand it, because I provide a file such as a logo or graphic image, that that is taxable. Is that correct? No, providing the logo or image is not taxable, provided you're not selling it outside of the client-customer um, relationship. So okay. in other words, if you're going to be developing a logo for a company and you provide them on a, you know, maybe it's on a, a CD or something like that, that is not taxable. That's part of the process. Okay. So that's part of the service or part of the process. Correct. Um, and then the second part, um, I think you, we kind of answered this, but, and is both the service of creating the logo and the actual logo product taxable? But what I heard you saying is that none of it is taxable. Correct. Okay. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, next question is, what is an example of an exempt entity? An exempt entity could be a church. It could be, um, like I said, a political subdivision of the state. The Department of Revenue is one of those. Um, another political subdivision could be the uh, city and county government. Um, it could be, let me think who else it could be. There are some hospitals that could be considered political subdivision. Um, I can't really, let me think of some other ones that would be a little different from that. Federal government, um, we get some people from the Department of Interior that do business in the state, they would be exempt. 
Um, so I guess that would be all I can think of off the top of my head. All right, excellent. Um, next question, if I sell an artwork online and ship it to an out-of-state location, do I charge the sales tax percent of the state it is going to? Yes, you would. And that's why I mentioned the remote sellers, because you could be and would be a remote seller in that state. So you would need to contact them to see what their thresholds are and whether you have any reporting or licensing requirements with them. Okay, great. If I sell an online course, do I charge sales tax for that? Does it matter if it's a pre-recorded set of teachings or one in real time? It wouldn't matter as long as um, you're not, the only thing with online courses is sometimes you have materials that get sold with them. So for example, if you were to sell a, maybe a textbook, um, if it's included in the price of that class, that textbook would be taxable to you as a business expense. If you're selling it separate from the course, then it's taxable to your customer and you would have to be licensed to collect that sales tax. Okay, so here's a similar question. Um, this person is a leadership coach and speaker, and they intend to add ebooks and online courses to their website that will be for sale. So, are those taxable? You know what? Um, ebooks, I'm not real sure. Um, if you would like to have that person call us, I can do some research on that and get that information for them. Okay. Well, maybe we can collect that and we'll send that out to the group um, Sure. and follow up that way. All right. Um, I'm the owner of my vehicle. If I want to lease that vehicle to my LLC company for liability reasons, no money exchanged, does the company need to pay tax on that lease? Oh, that is another tough one. Let me see. I think we're trying to stump you today, Lynn. Yeah, I think so. I think that would be one you'd have to actually write into the department about because we do have some exemptions regarding different parent companies and things like that, but they have to qualify. Okay, makes sense. All right, if anybody has any other questions, go ahead and enter them right now. And I'm just going to go through a little thank you for our funding partners. Um, as many of you know, the Wyoming Women's Business Center is made possible through lots of partnership agencies. Our primary funding comes from the U.S. Small Business Administration, the SBA, and also the Wyoming Business Council. And so, of course, we're thankful for their support. And here's some contact information just for the Women's Business Center. It's got information um, for my name as well as Waldo Smith with our microloan department. If you guys need any information about business counseling, please reach out to us. And then when we close out this webinar today, a survey is going to launch on your screen. So we thank you for attending and notice that our next webinar on content marketing and how to implement it is on Thursday, August 13th from noon to one o'clock. And it Let's see, we've got a few more classes that came in. Um, let's see, questions. So I've got, I teach classes in my retail shop. Is the teacher fee taxable? No, it is not. It's similar to teaching online. You're providing a service and that's not taxable. Okay. If our LLC leases a commercial vehicle to another business, is tax applicable? That sounds kind of similar to the last one, doesn't it? It does. And, I, you know, I'd like to be able to give answers to all of these, but sometimes, you know, the sales tax rules are not always black and white. So we have to um, basically look and see if they qualify for that. And then just somebody trying to clarify, just to confirm, for online courses in and of themselves, they do not require sales tax. Just the course themselves, you're teaching something online that is not taxable. That's a professional service. Excellent. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. Thank you, Lynn, for your expertise. We appreciate your time and your donation to our program and to our clients today. Um, stay safe out there, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.